Good morning from the Asia Pacific. Uh, just half an hour away from the opening bells, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. You're watching The China Show. I'm David Inglis. Let's get to your top stories today. Equity markets across the region down with treasuries as uh, the Fed's well, Fed official Chris Waller, of course, sounding a hawkish message a few hours back on the timing and also the number of rate cuts possibly this year. The yen steady after pulling back from prior intervention levels. Now, also ahead, we will be previewing earnings from China's troubled developers with Van Ke's profit expected to slide and Country Garden facing deeper losses. And I'm Stephen Engel at the Boao Forum on Highland, uh, Hainan Island, China. We're awaiting today's keynote from China's number three official who will be speaking here. This as, of course, President Xi up in Beijing makes a pitch to U.S. business chiefs to invest in China, despite, of course, what has been a well-documented struggling local economy. A, a warm welcome to all of you. Very good morning, very good Thursday morning from the Asia Pacific. I guess in many cases it's effectively Friday for most of these markets as we enter really the long weekend. Last trading session for a lot of markets as we head into, of course, the Easter weekend. Uh, very quickly, though, things were looking up until Christopher Waller happened and came out and effectively basically told us that, yeah, you know, uh, this, the progress that they've seen so far on inflation may have slowed, if not stalled. They're in absolutely no rush to reduce interest rates and, uh, I guess, proceed with easing. The current restrictive levels are doing their job. We'll have to wait more, for more details, of course, as far as that's concerned. And that being said, of course, PC numbers uh, are bookending this week for us. As you can see, there's a tone of generally risk aversion across these markets um, approaching the Chinese Open. Very quickly, overnight, S&P 500 up. Golden Dragon Index was flat, underperforming uh, the broader equity market uh, overnight. And certainly when you look at what Morgan Stanley has put out as we wrap up March, as we wrap up the first quarter, they have noticed, this is Morgan Stanley's concern, some flows coming through um, out of hedge funds, flows coming out of Chinese markets. They've been selling uh, ADRs uh, for the better part of March. More on that in a moment. Uh, we mentioned earnings. We're in the thick of things here. Banks very much in focus. The big developers Country Garden, China Bank out with earnings later today. There's a wall of maturities hitting, of course, uh, Vanco, which we'll talk about later in the show. We're looking at declines ahead of the open here, about 28 minutes away. And of course, all that being said, when you look at the Chinese currency, it's no surprise that given those hawkish comments coming out of Chris Waller, that Asian FX is an offer. And at 726, that actually takes you all the way back to October, November of last year in dollar China. Funding costs done, we'll get an update again in about give or take two and a half hours from now, really how much it's costing to short or even borrow the Chinese currency overnight. And, and certainly when you look at that, two year highs as far as the funding costs are concerned. All that being said, we talked about the yuan. The fix is going to be very much in focus today. How much backstop will we be getting? Um, how much anchoring will we be seeing out of the PBOC? 1,300 pips uh, was the spread yesterday estimate against the actual uh, fix uh, coming through. We talked about earnings. Uh, we'll talk about Xiaomi in just a moment. Uh, and, of course, the Bilbao Forum is still underway. And, of course, Steve Engel, of course, our man on the ground there, uh, is standing by with the next guest. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and, of course, there is a trading debut today, the first digital payments listing since Ant was pulled two, three, no, nearly four years ago at this moment. So we'll talk, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear from, of course, the boss at Lian Lian in also this hour as well. In any case, of course, in Beijing yesterday, China is open for business. President Xi Jinping also made his pitch to foreign investment and direct uh, group uh, of U.S. CEOs. He did meet with that group in Beijing, including Blackstone Stephen Schwartzman and also Qualcomm's Cristiano Amon. Have a look. The respective successes of China and the U.S. are opportunities for each other. As long as both sides regard each other as partners, respect each other, live in peace, and cooperate for win-win results, China-U.S. relations will become better. 
Stephen Engel has been covering the China's back to business, is open for business story for us. He's in Boa, of course, for us. Steve, your takeaway from that meeting yesterday, President Xi meeting this group of executives, of course, and there's a separate group of executives that are there with you on the ground at the Boa Forum in Hainan. Right. So some of those U.S. executives 2,700 kilometers to mm -hmm. the north in Beijing have trickled down here to the Boao Forum, arriving late last night. After that meeting, which was kind of delayed, it was speculated that, of course, these U.S. business leaders and members of academia would meet with a senior Chinese leader. That was well read as to being uh, Xi Jinping. And sure enough, that did happen. It was about an hour and a half. And by all accounts, it was a very candid, frank and friendly, cordial uh, exchange of ideas, questions and answers and the like going both ways across the giant table in the Great Hall of the People between the U.S. delegation and uh, Xi Jinping, as you can see there. And Xi said all the right things. He wants to create a first-class business environment in China. China's reform will not stop, and its opening up will not stop China's planning major measures to comprehensively deepen reforms and build what I just said, that first-class business environment. He acknowledges the challenges in the Chinese economy, obviously a slowing, sluggish economy right now, and property problems, but he said they have uh, what it takes to overcome those challenges. And he says exchanges are the key to resolve the differences between China and the United States. On those matters, let's bring in Henry Wong, of course, our next guest. So, Henry, you are an ambassador for both sides, really. You are a proponent of globalization. But in this current bifurcation, is mm -hmm. the multilateral approach sort of dead or on life support? And what's going to take to get dialogue going again? Well, thank you, Steve. I, I think the, the uh, you know, China probably is, is finally recovered from the COVID. I mean, even though the economy still takes some time. But I think the, uh, the people movement, you can see this time China Development Forum have almost, almost nearly 100 uh, global CEO come. And uh, sometimes some, some international institutions like President of World Bank, I, Managing Director IMF, and of course also Asian Development Bank and all those people. So, so I think China is, is, is you know, reboot, <laughs> starting yeah. actually uh, to take uh, effect now. And uh, so we see a lot of people coming back and people going out. And there was this ball form too, over 2,000 uh, people attending from around the world. So, so things starting to improve, I, I would say. The fact that these U.S. business leaders came to Beijing and had that meeting at the China Development Forum indicates they're interested in investing in China, obviously. But there are a lot of questions and concerns. Sure. Uh, one mm. is about opacity of mm. policy. And, and the direction of policy. And again, what is the new productive forces going to mean for even excess capacity in areas? Mm -hmm. Janet Yellen is yeah, coming next yeah. week. Yes. She's going to bring up those issues That's about right. subsidies and excess capacity. So they, on the one hand, want to engage with China, but they're concerned. Do you think Xi Jinping allayed some of those? Well, I think absolutely, you know, we heard quite a bit of those, uh, uh, of course, uh, concerns. Uh, uh, you know, that's true. But, but on the other hand, you know, when they talk about new quality productive forces, you remember 80 year, you know, 1980s and 90s, China used 700 million shirts to exchange for one point seven four seven, But now they can produce, uh, you know, a C919 uh, airplane now in China. So that means new productivity, you know, productivity. Of course, they have also uh, those, those new, new three the champion of EV cars, batteries and uh, solar panels. But also what's more, I think, you know, that that's uh, China consumer is going to really taking off uh, uh, to, you know, expanding the middle class. But they're not yet, Henry. Yeah, yeah. The consumer is worried just like many sure. of those business leaders meeting with Xi. They're worried about the future. Yeah. Because no. they haven't got an explanation either. Uh, that's right. I, I think the, uh, the uh, you know, Chinese government may have, uh, you know, a few more uh, tools in the toolbox. For example, uh, Premier Li Chang mentioned at the China Development Forum that there has uh, almost 300 million migrant workers. How to urbanize them? How to provide them a hukou and uh, you know, uh, you know, so stimulate to stay in the city? And maybe I think that in the future, maybe allow them to sell the household land in the rural area, so people from city can go and buy, and they can come buy the urban houses. So there will be new new momentum of uh, stimulating economy. But you need to you need to fix the housing problem. That, that's right. First, though. Exactly. So for, how are you going to do that? For example, in Hangzhou now they abolished the old restriction. It used to be uh, non Hangzhou resident cannot buy. Now everybody can buy it. I'm sure many cities have already done that. Lower uh, the mortgage rate. And I'm, what I'm saying also, the, the Premier League has actually specifically mentioned about these 250 million migrant workers. 
already in the city, 80s, born after the 80s, 90s, new millennium, they cannot go back. They, they are just, you know, city residents. So the urban, urbanization rate of China is 60, 60%. But people with the benefit with hukou is only 50%. There's 16%. People just, just stay there without any, uh, uh, you know, social status. So how to really, you know, uh, getting this 16% of Chinese population uh, really be urbanized. Which, which tool do you think is most readily available for authorities, fiscally or monetarily, to kind of kickstart the sluggishness of the economy? It's picked up a bit, Yes. and the stock market recovered, but the yeah. national team kind of came in and yeah. propped up sentiment, obviously. That's right, that's right. And there was consumption during the spring festival, which was good, but that usually peters out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what, what policy measures are needed? Well, I think there are several found. I mean, the first, they're, they're trying to stimulate the confidence. I think there's a little bit of recovery of the confidence domestically, internationally. So that, that you know, all those meetings, all those board, the CDF, President Xi meeting, uh, uh, part of that probably as well. Second, I think they are, they are still actually focusing on, the, on this new type of quali uh, quality protective forces, which means they're going to export more highly value added product or maybe also consume more also they are doing another uh, uh, policies to ask uh, all the factories uh, you know government agencies household to exchange their their, uh, their equipments now you know why not uh, sell your second hand car buy new cars and buy new computers new new uh, air phone, uh, apple phones and things like that so that is uh, there's a stimulate for that and also finally i think there's also good uh, uh, policies that china is really Increasing, they are selling to the, uh, you know, Belt and Road countries, global south, 80% of the global south. You know, ASEAN become the largest trading partner of China now. So, so I think they are, you know, not putting eggs in one basket, not, not diversifying, but also furthermore, they have to really stimulate the middle class in China. Like uh, Permili said, now we have 400 million, by next decade we're going to have 800 million. So they're going to have a lot of process. Urbanization, I think, is the biggest pub policy probably they're going to adopt. Uh, in the years to come. And a lot of that has to do with perhaps allowing the migrant workers, those hukos, to continue. Because the urbanization, which was really pushed by Li Keqiang, the former premier, uh, has kind of uh, lost momentum. Yeah. Because, again, a lot of people have moved to the cities. Yes. But you need to unlock that consumption yes. in the middle class. And I don't think trading in white goods like washing machines and yeah, yeah. dryers <laughs> is going to necessarily do it. No. Which comes first, the, the, the policy? Or the confidence first. Well, I, I personally, I think that uh, that you know, every ten years China has a revolutionary policy. In the 80s, the, the contract land to the farmers that changed China from a shortage economy to a bounding economy. In the 90s, Premier Zhu said, "Let's privatize all the apartments in the cities uh, for the workers." And that created 400 million middle class. And the year 2000, you know, then China John WTO, only a handful of company monopolized free trade. Now everybody can do free trade. China becomes the largest trading nation. Now it's the time they need the the full revolutionary policy, I think, to really to give the use the right of the farmers, the, the land, yeah. ho household land in a, a property, so that the, the property of the 300 million migrant workers can exchange that with uh, people in the urban, so that can stimulate the new uh, e economy. We're running out of time, but I have to ask you, since you are a, a proponent, it's in the title of your organization, Globalization, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a potential that Donald Trump would return to the office mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. the White House. Uh, what would that mean for the progress, if you see any, that we've made? Well, I think, the, you know, uh, I, I know Donald Trump, I mean, first term, he, he likes phase one, probably going to phase two, phase three, phase four. He is more deal-driven, more transacting you know, style president. Oh, there's certainly uncertainty. He could be more close to Russia and the things like that, or alienated the EU and, and, and NATO friends. But I think, you know, in this big uh, complex, China is going to be a big important force, even for North Korea issues, uh, for Middle East, and, and even for Russia, Ukraine war. I mean, you know, China can play a lot of mediating, so Donald Trump wouldn't have to need China to help. Uh, so I would expect, you know, uh, could be uh, worse, could be better. You know, that, that's still hard to say, but, but deal-driven. If it's like to make a deal, I mean, China is the best partner to make deals. So uh, I, I would not worry too much. What's the path forward to the growth target of about 5%? Well, I think that's probably going to happen. You know, you, every year China adds another almost Australian GDP to its, uh, to its GDP level. <laughs> but uh, but uh, if, if the base of last year is still there, so this year 5% will be consolidated. I think the most important is the confidence. I mean, if you have confidence, China has all the right element. You have 70% uh, of 5G networks in the world, two-thirds of global speed train networks in China, 12 million uh, college graduates every year. So all the synergies there, seven, you know, largest port in the world in China. So that's probably 
probably going to drive up all this, uh, you know, the synergy and supply chain and investment. So if that comes back, I mean, things we can pick up. We need policy clarity. We need yeah. policy clarity. Absolutely. Not just trust us. We'll get it done. Of course. Policy yes, clarity. Yes. Henry Wong, thanks so much Thank for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. TV. Always great yeah. to talk to you. Okay. okay, David, we're going to send it back to you. More to come from increasingly cloudy Bowau on Hainan Island. There. Yeah. There we go, Steve. Uh, great stuff there with Henry Wang, of course, founder, president, Center for China and Globalization. Almost right on time here as you look at these FX markets. Uh, Chris Waller's comment, sending the dollar stronger. And I can tell you right now, 151.50 on dollar yen is at a session high. Uh, two-year yields are up. U.S. two-year yields, to be more specific. Uh, we're up three, four basis points. The reference rate for today is now out, 709.48 uh, uh, against uh, the U.S. dollar. We're looking for estimates of 722 and change right now. I'm just looking at how uh, the spread between the fix and the actual. Uh, we're looking at actually quite a substantial one coming through here. Let me just bring up my Bloomberg terminal just to get a sense of what the math looks like and make the, make the uh, AI do the work for me. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, 1,300 earnest. Thank you so much, our producer. And 24 pips is your spread for the day. That being said, at 726, it's barely moving the needle as far as this is concerned. Right, just ahead, we'll talk about these earnings coming through out of Chinese developers, how the, well, how they performed really uh, as we wrapped up 2023 and how the outlook effectively is shaping up as we make our way, of course, into 2024 and the rest of 2024. That ahead, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to show. It's 10 minutes to the opening bell. We're in the thick of earnings season. A couple of big banks reported yesterday a recap of what we've seen. Uh, only China merchants actually beat. Uh, the rest missed expectations. And, of course, also when you look at the brokerages like Citic Securities also came out with earnings there as well. Coming out today, we're still focused in on the banks, although we're also keeping one eye, or if not one and a half eyes or both, <laughs> on developers because we have a whole slew of very big names coming through uh, later today. And certainly we'll, we'll get a gauge of financial health all things making very, very simple. Christy Hong is with us here on set. Bloomberg Intelligence, China Property Analyst. Let's start with the big one, Vanco, of course, what we're expecting there amidst news recently of, 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 of concerns uh, meeting obligations here. Right, so I think for most developers, falling revenue and margins mm. and high impairment due to home price decline, these are widely expected. Mm. But I think what is important for Vanco is, you know, what is the state of liquidity as of end December? We are already seeing a lot of liquidity red flags, but it would be interesting to know. And I think in particular for Vanco, you know, it would be closely watched as to, you know, what is its dividend payout going to be? The developer has paid out hefty dividend for years, and if there's any sign of a scale back that is also another re liquidity reflect. Okay, Country Garden is also out today. Yes, um, so for balance sheet wise, Country Garden, I think bondholders are going to focus on what are the available assets that would A is restructuring planned and also, you know, can take cue from Country Garden's balance sheet as mm. to what is the wider economic impact on the, you know, from the China's property sector. You know, mm. Country Garden has 600 billion yuan of pre sale properties pending delivery, 450 billion yuan of bills that are still unpaid to suppliers and contractors. And imagine a lot of other private developers they are in a similar place. Play. And what is not helping is that in the first two months of the year, contractor sales is still in a steep slump. Mm. And, you know, our view is that the recovery outlook is very dim for the rest of 2024. Are we seeing a, an emerging trend, a divergence between, you know, the different types of developers? Yeah. State-owned, state-backed, mm. yeah. and, and private? Yeah, so I think for state-owned developers, we saw Xiao Lan, show reporter earnings. They're showing remarkable resilience, mm. healthy earnings earnings and healthy dividend payouts. And I think but what is important for them from here is the outlook on Fanky. Uh, one curve with, you know, if is escalate, uh, continue, uh, liquidity crisis continue to escalate, that is going to be a problem for other state-owned names. If lenders and buyers start to question, you know, are they also viable? And that is going to impact the outlook on their revenue 
and also refinancing. Fantastic work. Christy Hung, of course, we'll let you go. We know it's a busy day for you ahead. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence China property analyst. In fact, just ahead here, we'll look at the banking angle to the property story, exposure, loan book, non-performing loans, and the outlook with Fitch. They're joining us in a couple of minutes, about 10 minutes from now. Stay tuned for that interview, of course, uh, with the head of Greater China Bank Ratings, Grace Wu. Right, coming down to the open of trade, we should be pushing lower seven minutes to the opening bell. Here's a look, an early snapshot. There we go. The open is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. In my view, it is appropriate to reduce the overall number of rate cuts or push them further into the future in response to the recent data. That comment leading to this market reaction you're about to see on your screens, taking the wind out of these risk assets as we make our way into Thursday, risk aversion, risk off session. And you know, keep in mind, we're coming off a strong session in Wall Street, and then we had that speech from Christopher Waller in between uh, the close in the U.S. and the Asia Open, hence weakness across the Asian FX space. Uh, we're looking at funding costs going into the session today, and certainly it's getting really more expensive to borrow the Chinese currency to short it, which might actually help at the margins to your high as far as those costs are concerned. Morgan Stanley, as we wrap up this quarter and month, and what's really been, generally speaking, a decent month for Chinese equity markets, certainly more so onshore than offshore, but recently they've started to observe some outflows coming through, and not just the China-Hong Kong story. Japan's also seen its fair share of outflows, institutional fund flows. These are hedge funds, of course, coming through. This is according to the Morgan Stanley report. Some inflows coming through, though, all that being said, Oz, Taiwan, and also uh, in Singapore. Now, we mentioned earnings season, analyst actions here, Weibo, Goldman Sachs out, cutting ADRs and also eight shares. Uh, eight shares to neutral, 83 bucks a pop. Heidi Lau and Meng Nyo were out uh, two days back with earnings. Earnings reaction yesterday. Just a recap of some of the analyst actions and some of the changes in ratings here coming through as we make our way into the Thursday session. And going into the session today, we talked about this big uh, big names in, in the real estate space coming out with their earnings. Van and Country Garden will, for, for I guess obvious reasons, take uh, take the fair lion's share of the attention today. All that being said, though, you're also getting a lot more coming through Sunak China, bottom of your screens, and also big banks are coming out with earnings as well uh, today. Right, so we're going into the open, just over three minutes away. By the way, I haven't said this. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. The China Open is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show, 40 seconds to the opening bell. Quite another strong fix out of the PBOC. Funding costs, two-year high to borrow the Chinese currency. Chris Waller's comments adding maybe salt, uh, further salt to injury here. Uh, well, a stronger dollar, more hawkish Fed. It's March, and as you can see here on a live shot, Shanghai and Hong Kong. Mo Monday, Thursday, isn't it? Uh, quite literally, because sometimes the snow does come down in March as it does in June. Welcome back to the show. You're watching the China Open. We're coming off quite a, a weak uh, session on Wednesday onshore. CSI 300 was down 1%. We were flat in the Golden Dragon Index uh, overnight despite that rally we had in U.S. equity markets. We're going into the Thursday session and here we go. The opening number is on your screens right now for you. Also look at some of the other benchmarks we're tracking. HS Tech, of course, three tenths of 1% in the opening minutes. So some weakness coming through in these markets. 16.4 Hang Seng, MSCI China, 54 and a quarter, 3,500, let's call it even, on the CSI 300. Ten-year yield trading at, well, back, back below 2.3%. The spread on the midpoint of the day to estimates, 13.24 pips. Uh, a trading debut today, Lian Lian Digitech, bottom of your screens, 5%. So weak first day at school. This is the first digital payments company to, well, I think to, uh, to make its trading debut and raise money here in Hong Kong since Ant was actually pulled uh, about three and a half years back, I believe. 2020? Was it 2019? I think it was 2020. Anyway, some time ago. There we go. Earnings, flip the boards, please. So I guess a, a decent cross-section of, 
uh, really Chinese industry, right? Everything from consumer appliances, which is the first ticker you see on your screens, Tianxi Lithium, out with earnings as well. I think that was a miss as far as that specific company is concerned. And we'll get, we'll really, the next few hours, we'll see these big developers come out with their earnings as well. Right, uh, Zhongguo, Gongshang, Yinhang, ICBC, flats, net income beating estimates there. China Merchants Bank was also out with earnings, and coming through today is Bank of China, Ag Bank, among the others which are set to release earnings today. For a perhaps half-time report on Chinese banks, let's bring in Grace Wu, head of Greater China Bank Ratings at Fitch. Nice to see you, and good morning. Good morning. So we're, I think we're waiting for a few more banks to come out, but so far, have any trends emerged? So any consistency so far? Yeah. I mean, it's not the best set of results, um, mm. uh, admittedly, uh, though not unexpected. Mm. Uh, we have already warned of uh, revenue pressures uh, since last year. Uh, and unfortunately, some of those pressures are still going to linger for 2024. Uh, you would still have uh, the impact of further uh, loan prime rate reductions. Mm. Um, the one in February, that's going to kick in for the rest of the year and into 2025. Uh, you also have, of course, then the re reduction in the mortgage um, rates, which will also suppress margins mm. and broader capital markets are also not conducive to bank fee income mm. uh, so that national I expect the revenue pressures will persist for the sector uh, in 2024 uh, can you put a number to that how much squeeze do you see on m margins for example which have been falling uh, already, right? You mentioned the five-year loan. I think we're below four yes. percent on that. Well, we, we estimated that, well, with regards to February's loan prime rate reduction, yeah. which was uh, a big one, that, right? That will have uh, roughly about six percent um, net profit impact okay. over the course of 2024 to 2025. Okay. Um, the w what about the offsets? So, you know, lowering deposit rates. Are they are they actually heeding the call? From officials to lend to developers because you know the hit only happens if you if they start lending extending credit in a big way yeah. uh, to these developers. Yeah, we've not necessarily seen big increases in terms of property developer lending. We think okay. the banks are still very cautious. Uh, what we can see from the results is that clearly the you know, the property development NPLs continue to to increase uh, mm. from end 2022. Although the pace of increase has um, moderated uh, since first half last year. Uh, so we would expect there would still be some pressure, but in terms of new MPL formation for the property sector, uh, that should start to moderate. But with regards to the revenue pressure, because you know the, the mortgage, the, the housing transactions, that's not really picking up. Mm. So that's still suppressing um, overall retail loan growth because mortgage is such a big segment. And you mentioned MPL, just to pick up on that. Why, why is that going to why do you think that's going to fall this year? Um, it, it, the NPL ratio itself may continue to increase, but the, yeah, the new, absolute value, yeah. the, the new NPL yeah. uh, formation, like the the, um, the increase in NPL, we think that will start to moderate uh, for the property sector. That is going to be benefiting from the policy measures. Okay. Uh, and uh, for the uh, economy more broadly, you know, we've started to see uh, some uptake in some of the other consumer loans, so we'll be monitoring that uh, fairly closely. Mm. Uh, and with regards to mortgage asset quality, for the time being, we're still relatively comfortable because of very prudent um, loan-to-value ratios in China. Um, but if you know broader economic indicators were to um, deteriorate further, then surely at some point that will start to impact unemployment rate, uh, which is actually to, to us more sensitive with regards to mortgage asset quality. Hmm. Are you seeing, on that note, are you seeing mortgages or mortgage lending start to pick up? Uh, very mildly, uh, okay. because uh, until until the home sales pick up, right? right. Uh, for the moment, uh, for Fitch is still expecting a five to ten percent decline in terms of home sales for 2024, mm. uh, and you know the numbers over the next couple of months are, are also going to uh, be quite suppressed because you've got a high base uh, last year uh, when there was a lifting of COVID. So you don't have some of those factors uh, that's going to repeat. Um, in, in 2024, so I think the next couple of months are still going to be quite challenging. Interesting enough, uh, we're just going to flash this for our viewers. China Everbright uh, shares are down 10%, guys, um, after that earnings miss. I mean, Grace, I'll, you know, we, we talked about non-performing loans. Generally speaking, asset quality on these balance sheets haven't quite—I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this properly—haven't haven't become an issue amidst what's still a weak economy. What's kept asset quality okay? 
Right. I think the what the sector that are experiencing the most stress, so the uh, the property developers, the banks in uh, the banks direct lending to these sectors are quite small. Uh, it's mm. about five percent of loans. Okay. So that's why even though there's a lot of stress in that sector. It hasn't necessarily impacted the bottom line figure as much. Right. At the same time, the banks are also uh, have basically since 2017 have been quite active in resolving MPLs. So, in one way to think about it is, you know, the banks have already started. Uh, provisioning and, and recognizing some of these MPLs even mm. before the property uh, crisis began in 2021. So um, on one hand, it, it does put the bank in a better position compared to a few years ago to withstand the challenges that we're seeing today. Mm. Uh, but you know, all things equal, if the home sales does not recover, it's still going to be an issue. Okay. Does that are we are markets supposed to be expecting any major capital raising exercise then or I guess to your point maybe not yeah well for the uh, big four state banks mm. uh, because they've got uh, the TLAC requirements so we do expect them to be raising more capital mm. uh, initially we expect the uh, issuance will primarily be onshore okay. uh, and um, the issuance amount really would depend on whether uh, the regulators will allow full inclusion of the deposit insurance scheme uh, because because, What's the connection between the two? Yeah, because the full uh, the full inclusion of the deposit insurance fund as part of the uh, TLAC requirement would substantially reduce the amount of additional capital uh, issuance that the banks will have to do. On our estimates, if it was included in full, mm. uh, then there's for uh, uh, for. Uh, a few of the state banks actually there there wouldn't be um, uh, any shortfall okay. by 2025, uh, okay. January 2025, uh, and it will also substantially reduce the amount that they need to raise by January 2028. Right. right? But that said, you know we do expect uh, some issue, capital issuance this year. We've seen that the banks basically have largely uh, maintained their, their payout mm. uh, because I think that that's very important. I think uh, um, because the, the for, for equity investors in particular, I think the dividend right. yield is also a very uh, important aspect. Uh, so I think the banks will be uh, quite balanced in terms of uh, you know balancing the uh, shareholder rewards and also balancing uh, gains that with their uh, capital raising plans. Uh, admittedly with you know, fairly weak uh, internal capital generation this year. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah you mentioned dividends. Like, that's, that, that's just about the only thing really that uh, investors have been latching on as far as banks. Final question for you, are any of these banks at risk? Uh, in terms of ratings downgrades this year from you guys? Yeah, well, for Fitch, all of our Chinese bank ratings are driven by our expectations of government support. Okay. Uh, so if there's any changes in the um, mm. government, in the solvent's ability or propensity to provide support to these banks, uh, then their, their ratings could be impacted. Grace, nice to see you. Fantastic. We'll end on that positive note. Grace Wu there, head of Greater China Bank's ratings at Fitch, right? At Fitch ratings, to be more. Uh, comprehensive. All right, uh, just ahead, we'll be hearing from the, the CEO of Lian Lian uh, Digitech. That's the first uh, fintech firm, of course, to list here in Hong Kong. First payments firm, to be more precise here, since the Ant Group IPO was actually scrapped uh, in 2020. Shares are down. First day at school. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Trading debut today, biggest drop on record. Well, it's only been trading one day, so any move certainly today will um, give you a decent superlative to write your parents home. Uh, about 7.5% first day at school. Um, yeah, well, it's certainly, I think, the, the, the context here, this is the first digital payments firm to actually list and raise money since Ant, uh, the Ant Group IPO was actually scrapped. Uh, earlier, in fact, we spoke with the CEO, I spoke with the CEO, uh, Jia Shin, about the stringent approval process they actually had to go through to make this day happen. Have a look. The approval process it now uh, probably will be a very high barrier 
for our peers uh, to go through all the uh, process. Mm. Uh, so we decided to enter the market whenever we're ready, mm. uh, we're able to, then uh, leverage uh, the competitive edge uh, of the global capital market. So you're, you're, you're first out of the gates, uh, as you mentioned. Exactly. So a lot of attention will be on you guys as well, exactly. following what, I guess, what you're pointing out to was a fairly challenging uh, several years. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it might be difficult for some of your, your peers to follow. Just talk us through some of the uh, unique challenges for our global audience, unique challenges you had to go through to actually get the approval to list at this point in time. Yeah, well, get all the approval process down and need to be in full compliance with all the regulations. Okay. And uh, Lillian is a company with a philosophy of uh, compliance first. Mm. So we have been strictly follow all the regulations and rules. Mm. Um, and for our peers, they have different uh, corporate structure. We are an H company, uh, a share company, that is a PRC company. Mm. Uh, most of our peers are VIE structure. Uh, so they have flexibility in terms of the operation. Uh, but on the other side, uh, they're not, uh, they probably need more time and efforts to be in full compliance. Absolutely, yeah. And I think your latest market share, if I'm not mistaken, is around 9%. Exactly. Around 9%. Would you describe the, the, the sector as highly fragmented? 9%. You're among the top, if not the number one. Correct me if I'm wrong, of course, in that statistic. Yeah. Uh, but that does seem like there are a lot of other players out there. Yeah, well, it is highly fragmented. We have over 190 license uh, in PRC okay. for uh, the third-party payment service. Mm. Uh, and for cross-border, uh, we have several strong uh, peers. Mm. Uh, so yes, we have a lot of uh, potential opportunity for future cooperation and MA. For a global audience, what, if you could highlight for us one or two mega trends that you think will be important to watch in your industry in the years to come? Well, we believe that uh, as a uh, global factory, uh, China would still be a uh, large supplier to the global consumer products okay. and, and, and services. Uh, we are helping them to be better uh, adaptive to the market change, uh, but try to provide global consumers uh, high quality and uh, uh, not expensive uh, products. So that's going to be still the trend uh, we believe in the coming a few years. Jia Xin, the boss there of uh, Lianlian Digitech, which uh, down 7% the first day of trade. Uh, and certainly the listing comes as Hong Kong authorities are really looking for ways to revive the city stock market and deal making. Certainly we've put out several stories on this, particularly when you look at uh, well, who used to be high-flying bankers uh, amidst this drought in, in deals. Now the latest setback, of course, the big one earlier this week was Alibaba's decision to then scrap that blockbuster, potentially blockbuster listing of its logistics unit, Hainiao. Let's bring in uh, Felipe Pacheco, our equity capital markets reporter, give us the big picture here. So how important really was that? The Tainiao deal, potential one, well, no longer David, uh, to Hong Kong. Super, super important. I think that last year uh, we were talking about when those big deals would come back to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Bankers were getting ready for them. Alibaba announced a restructuring within the uh, the firm that would bring a lot of different companies to the market, giving a lot of work to those bankers that were actually desperate for deals here in Hong Kong. But this scenario has changed so much since then. Uh, high volatility with equities trading here in Hong Kong. Of course, sentiment towards China, economic growth within China, and also the uh, step up in, uh, in the regulation internally, onshore, as we just heard uh, mm. from the CEO. There's been a lot of changes within uh, mainland China in the process that companies actually can have access to uh, equities market through IPOs or even through a secondary shale. In Hong Kong, of course, the rules are not exactly the same, but mm. that doesn't mean that they don't need to get those, authori those right. authorizations there. Alibaba came as, as a hit to the IPO market here in Hong Kong as a whole because there were hopes that the China Tainiao's uh, IPO could actually bring a few others to market. And this is the second time within, what, four months that we hear Alibaba saying that they are not moving on with those big deals. Yeah, the restructuring of the restructuring of Alibaba is how, is how we're putting it. So before the deal was pulled, how would you describe sentiment? And I guess after the deal was pulled, 
I'm guessing things remain fairly secure. It's quite curious, David, because we were getting ready to write what we call the quarter enders, those stories that just give a sense of what was the, uh, the quarter behind us <laughs> and what's coming next. Yeah. And this happened in the middle of uh, our conversation with yeah. sources. And this, it's, it's almost like a, it's a very clear example of what's the sentiment in the market right now. When you talk to bankers, when you talk to fund managers who are looking basically at Hong Kong's market, the sentiment is very, very negative. Mm. It's, it's not that it's just negative. There's very little hope that there will be an improvement in the upcoming quarters. If we talk about numbers, for example, this quarter, first quarter of 2024, uh, 508 million US dollars raised by 10 different IPOs here in Hong Kong, including the one that just started trading mm. today. That's the worst quarter quarter uh, since 2009. Since the second quarter of 2009, we were talking about financial crisis at that right. moment. So there's no expectation that the second or the third quarter can be a lot better than what we've seen. And of course, if you take an IPO that's expected to be 1 billion US dollars or so out of the table, that means that the rest of the year is not looking uh, very good. So just to give an example, if we talk to bankers right now, mm. they want to talk about India, they want to talk about Japan, mm. they want to talk about deals that are definitely not going to be based here in Hong Kong. Yeah, I mean, 2009, that comparison's not, certainly not the most flattering one, is it? Well, I don't know if this is still worth asking you. Are, are, is there hope? I think there are some through? deals out there that we know that they're expected to come to market, mm -hmm. some within the tech sector within uh, from China, some mm -hmm. names that we know that they are going uh, through approvals and they are actually talking to bankers, some of them around 500 million US dollars. Uh, we have Horizons uh, a company that is actually very close to launching a deal maybe in the second quarter. Some deals are on 500 million to 1 billion US dollars. There is a pipeline. Yes, there is a pipeline. If there is a window open for those deals to come to market, that's a completely different question. Felipe, fantastic. Felipe Pacheco there uh, on, well, what remains and hopefully does not continue to remain a uh, fairly subdued uh, equity capital market here for, for fundraising. Okay, uh, by the way, speaking of Hong Kong, you do you can get an insider's guide to uh, both the money and the people are combined, shaping up uh, the financial hub. Our Hong Kong edition newsletter is out. That's out every Thursday, and you can sign up if you haven't already on Bloomberg.com slash newsletters. Right, uh, just a mark here, Hong High Precision, Chairs are up and running and have been up and running almost an hour now over in Taiwan and 3% that takes the price 153 to the, an intraday record. Why? AI. That simple. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. I think China would be very happy to see that uh, through working together with other entities like World Bank Group, ADB, and uh, EBRD and others, we can promote common prosperity. The Chinese government may have uh, you know, a few more uh, tools in the toolbox. For example, uh, Premier Li Chang mentioned at the China Development Forum that there is almost 300 million migrant workers. How to urbanize them? How to provide them a full call and uh, you know, uh, you know, so stimulate to stay in the city? We're multilateral institutions. We're owned by governments. Our three biggest owners, uh, Japan, US, China. Um, and frankly, within the institution, uh, we don't see a lot of daylight between their positions um, on this issue of core mandate, the, the, the desire for us to do a lot more on climate. Um, they're all speaking the same language on this. Some of our guests there from the Boao Forum uh, taking place. And you know, by the way, I've gotten a lot of, um, not a lot of questions, several, enough uh, uh, questions on how to pronounce it to Bo Ao is Bo, Bo Jackson, and Wow. Surprised. Anyway, certainly not Wow has been your 60 poor 40 portfolio and did not mean that on purpose. Um, as we wrap up this quarter, it's the second straight quarter that the 60 40 mix has actually done okay, but that's only done okay because stocks have done exceptionally well. Uh, we're, really, were it not for that specific part of that portfolio, that would be done. In fact, global bonds on aggregate are actually down as we wrap up the first quarter, certainly on the back of this repricing of uh, rate cut expectations around the Fed. As it pertains to the Chinese markets, something interesting happened actually this quarter that we haven't really seen in about uh, 12 months or so. Uh, onshore China is actually higher. Offshore, 
lower in the form of the Hang Seng China Index, MSA China, most of which, of course, are certainly securities listed outside of mainland China. CSI 300 closed higher, or is poised to close higher, at least, as we wrap up the first quarter. Uh, in terms of bonds, right, so we talked about this rally in CGBs. That's done well. Maybe the policy bank offset uh, is why that specific group is actually flat. We talked about the weakness in the currency. Now, as far as bond markets go, global treasuries, not good on the back of this Fred repricing and the pushing back of rate cuts. On aggregate, we talked about this, we're down. The only pocket that's actually done well uh, is high yield. I guess that's also on the back of expectations that the U.S. economy is doing well, so those spreads continue to tighten uh, even, even further. Top markets, top four, at least, global equity markets, benchmarks. Um, there we go. Nigeria, Argentina, Kenya, and sneaking in fourth is Japan at 20% on price year to date so far. Right. So we're wrapping up the quarter, really. I mean, technically, we have one more day, but most of the region is actually off tomorrow. So Hong Kong last trading session, along with all of these other markets, which are shut from, from tomorrow. The Philippines is already shut today. And, well, that's how the rest of the next week looks. So it's a long weekend ahead. This is Bloomberg. There have been inquiries about how China and the United States can achieve a closely intertwined relationship. And my answer is exchange. Exchange, cooperation, and eventually accommodation. Then we will become closely intertwined. Chinese President Xi Jinping there speaking during his meeting on Wednesday with uh, well, a group of U.S. CEOs in Beijing, some of whom actually have uh, took the late flight Wednesday and made their way down to Hainan, where the BOA Forum is taking place, and live pictures right now of the BOA Forum. And we are looking into, of course, this live speech uh, coming through out of the chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, Zhao Leji, uh, speaking, of course, at the opening plenary for the BOA Forum for Asia. Um, that is the keynote speech at the event. So we'll revisit this and we'll bring you any major headlines coming through out of uh, the speech coming through there. And of course, we'll be revisiting, of course, uh, Bo Wow with our Stephen Engel, of course, our chief North Asia correspondent, who's just outside, of course, at Plenary Hall, where that speech is taking place. In the meantime, though, CSI 300 on your right, we've been bobbing and weaving. Uh, for the most part of this morning. Volumes are on the lighter side, 15% lighter uh, than usual. Just keep in mind we are still uh, on set to, to clock in despite the, the downdraft of the last week, week and a half or so. Uh, an up quarter on the CSI 300. We're down today though and quite noticeably we're down 1.3% on the Nikkei 225. Perhaps that's also down to some window dressing ahead of, uh, I guess, what's really been a very, very good quarter for the Nikkei 225. Also comments coming through uh, before the open of most markets in the Asia Pacific and in between the U.S. close out of Christopher Wallet talking about how, you know, this progress that they've seen on inflation has either slowed or stalled and they're in certainly no rush, really underscoring and reminding markets of that very point. They're in no rush. Uh, to cut interest rates at this point in time. Your treasury yield is higher just about across the board. And as you can see, you're short and it's repricing maybe some of those comments, quite literally 4, 3, 2, 1 uh, on the 2, all the way up the curve to the 30 at 4.36%, still inverted, as you can see on your screens there. Uh, a couple of big movers to tell you about 30 minutes into the Chinese market session, about an hour into the Taiwan session, Hon Hai precision there. Uh, session high still should be about these levels. We're just coming off a little bit at 153. That should take you still to all-time highs intraday on Hong Kong. Lian Lian Digitech is, is, is a trading debut here uh, in Hong Kong. The first payments platform to list since Ant was actually pulled. So that's the sort of global significance of that for 6% down. Everbright and Sani Heavy, bank and heavy equipment maker listed. These are the HRs. Uh, as you can see on your screens, down substantially on the back of those earnings misses and earnings coming through as well. Well, there's a big earnings theme as well. We'll preview more coming up. In the meantime, though, as promised, let me uh, take you straight back 
uh, to the Boal Forum taking place in Hainan. And on the ground there, man on the, on the ground is Stephen Engel, Chief North Asia Correspondent. Uh, Steve, uh, we talked about this meeting that took place Wednesday. Key group of executives there out of the U.S., some of which, as you point out, have made their way down there to where you are uh, in Hainan. China is open and back for business. Steve. Yeah, that's part of the charm offensive that Xi Jinping tried to uh, portray, of course, and also here down at the Boal Forum for Asia, trying to re-engage uh, commercial ties with the rest of the world after really uh, what's been punishing past four years, three years under COVID-0, and then a slowing and uh, sluggish uh, uh, rejuvenation, if you will, of the local economy here in China. So Xi Jinping, uh, you know, was pretty cordial. And if you roll the video, you can see he was pretty engaging with the group in the Great Hall of the People of U.S. Uh, executives and those from academia, including Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone and other executives, whether it was from FedEx or Qualcomm and the like. And now we're hearing from uh, the number three man uh, the, on the standing committee. He is the chairman of the National People's Congress. Uh, we're talking about Zhang Leji. Uh, he is speaking, I believe I can see on the monitor. We're not getting headlines yet from his speech, but it will probably be uh, along the same uh, themes. I'm still not getting the hot head that we're hearing that it is coming across. Maybe, David, uh, you can uh, talk about the hot head that has crossed the wires. Yeah. Yeah, you know, this is actually fairly nuanced, Stephen. I know it's a fairly small monitor maybe you're looking at on your screens, and I'm just looking at my, my version of a small monitor right now. Uh, a shot at the crowd. I don't believe that uh, Mr. Zhao yet said that speech has yet to actually begin. We'll obviously bring to our viewers when that speech actually starts in any any newsworthy headlines that comes out of that as well. Uh, but Steve, what, if you could just build on the thought that you were pointing out earlier, because you've spoken to, and at length in, in some cases, um, to, to, to a lot of business leaders who've made their way either directly from the West into China or from Beijing at that meeting uh, into where you are right now, what's the overall sense you're getting? Are they buying into this message? Well, they're here to listen to what the message is. And the fact that they've made the effort to come here to China, whether it's the China Development Forum over the weekend or at uh, Boao here, and I believe that is, is that Ban Ki-moon who is speaking, the former UN yep, Secretary General, who's now speaking. So we're not yet to, uh, we're not yet to Zhao, who will come up and essentially open the four-day conference here, which has already been going for three days. Uh, do things a little bit backwards here, but that's okay. We've been waiting for Zhang. Uh, but again, the U.S. business leaders and those who I've talked to, they want to get a little bit more clarity on the policy measures that came out of the National People's Congress. They want to see what the government is going to be doing by providing and putting some, uh, you know, policy behind the promises to open up. Uh, essentially, you know, Xi Jinping yesterday uh, talked to the U.S. executive saying they want to create a first-class business environment. Okay, well, that's great. Everyone would want a first-class business environment, but how is that going to come about and what does that entail? So a little bit more clarity on what has been uh, rather opaque messaging coming from Beijing since the National People's Congress and their path towards a recovery, Dave. Yeah, Steve, just a final question for you. I and mean, arguably, you know, the, the audience that China wants to reach and arguably the group that's actually there on the ground um, are more or less the people that are convinced. Uh, it's the incremental money that's sitting outside that haven't made their way either literally into, into Hainan or where their pocketbooks into these Chinese markets that Beijing has to convince. What's the sense you get from the people that you talk to there of what they still need to see uh, to convince their peers that China is open, back, uh, is open for business? Yeah, look, this is still an incredibly attractive market. There's no doubt about that. But it yeah. has been clouded by the bifurcation of supply chains and the export curbs from the United States and essentially the geopolitical struggles. Look, we're going to get another front opened up perhaps next week when Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, will be here. She's going to talk about her concerns and the U.S. concerns about excess capacity, industrial capacity in green areas and green products, uh, part of Xi Jinping's new three uh, 
initiative, all part of new quality productive forces, more buzzwords, and that essentially means more emphasis and money will be put into these areas. So we're talking new energy vehicles, we're talking batteries, we're talking solar power, and there's concern from Janet Yellen and others that they are going to be potentially, with that excess industrial capacity in those areas, dumping the products onto Western markets. So there is another front opened up, and that's the concern, is that more fronts continue to be opened up in uh, a, a bifurcated, bifurcated geopolitical and commercial landscape. But these people that I've spoke to, like the AstraZeneca CEO, the Fortescue Metals chairman, Andrew Forrest, I spoke to them yesterday, they're already heavily invested in China. They want to see, uh, you know, more engagement. So, again, it's about reading what they say backed by policy implementation. The follow-through is what they're going to want to see. Steve, we'll be back with you a bit later on. As Steve was pointing out, of course, he's there in Bilbao and uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, speaking right now ahead of uh, Zhao Luji, who is the chairman of the standing committee uh, of the NPC, which he should be starting uh, any moment. Now, we'll bring you that feed uh, in just a moment. To Steve's point, and just maybe a little bit of local context here, the Economic Daily front page editorial today, to Chinese, so bear with me here, um, and our colleagues have uh, done a fantastic job at the translate. And just to make it very, very simple, right? The policy and the predictability of policy and the clarity of such is, is front and center here that China should create a stable, transparent, and predictable policy environment to boost the country's economic recovery. That's the front page editorial today at the Economic Daily. Right, still ahead here on The China Show, Art Basel returns on that note somewhat full force here in Hong Kong in a test of the city's ability to stage major events. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but ahead of that, we'll talk market strategy with JP Morgan Asset Management, and they're still leaning towards U.S. and Japanese equities. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Our medium-term forecast is actually for the yen to strengthen somewhat. I think over the next year or so, we think it should head back towards 140, uh, primarily driven by uh, the, the thoughts of, of the Fed easing further down the road and, and somewhat tighter uh, Japan policy. So, so we think that the, the, the medium-term uh, picture would be for a slightly stronger yen. In my view, it is appropriate to reduce the overall number of rate cuts or push them further into the future in response to the recent data. I see no rush in taking the step of beginning to ease monetary policy. Hawkish tone coming out of Chris Waller there. Speaking about, what time is it now, 10? Speaking about three, three and a half hours back, right in between the U.S. close and the Asia open, so the U.S. was better, and hence the Asia open and the Asia session not really too good. And also numerous Christopher Wilcox there speaking about, talking about the Japanese yen should be stronger um, this year, at least that's the trend. Okay, Sylvia Sheng is with us right now to talk us through those comments, what it means for Mark as global multi-asset strategist at J.P. Morgan Assets Management. He was hawkish, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. What happens in his equity market if the Fed doesn't cut this year? I think even without uh, loosening our monetary policy, we are seeing growth being very resilient in the U.S. We think this year U.S. growth is going to um, go to around 2 percent, which is still slightly above trend. So we think the fundamental picture is very supportive of U.S. equities. Okay, so overweight U.S. equities, that's still the, that's still the uh, other parts of these global equity market? So we still like? like Japan, which okay. was, we think is, again, a very strong fundamental picture. We're seeing wage growth came in very strong. That is mm. likely to support consumption recovery. And we think the corporate governance reforms has further to go. That's going to support valuation as well. Right. You're not concerned over the potential strengthening of the yen and that negative correlation snapping back? I, I think that's definitely a risk, especially where the yen is right now. I think there's definitely room for it to strengthen. Mm. But we do take comfort in the fact that BOJ has gone consistently talked about being very gradual in their policy normalization, mm -hmm. so we don't see a very accelerated pace of rate hikes. Right, and as we wrap up the first quarter, just give me a sense of what you know, the sentiment is among, among your clients and risk appetite among them. So I think uh, the, our overall uh, position is still pro-risk, okay. and uh, that is still uh, comfortable kind of with clients right now. Mm. But th we are getting questions about the valuation levels right now, whether we're concerned, given a lot of markets are making new highs. 
Right, and I guess you almost you answered that already. I think in terms of you're still overweight equity markets. Why should we be comfortable with valuations then at, at these levels? And considering that if we don't get cuts, because some, I think Morgan Stanley came out with a note this week and say that said, effectively said that the Fed needs to cut rates to justify these multiples at these levels? So I think if we look at valuations, yeah, compared to history, they are elevated, but we need to take into consideration that sector composition has mm. shifted. So if we look at more from profitability perspective, valuation we think is more fair. So really what we need to see is the earning side to deliver to justify those levels of valuations. Okay. Uh, fixed income, how, do you, how are you thinking about duration at this point in time? So we're currently leaning neutral duration given we think before the Fed starts to cut, um, uh, we're looking at uh, more range-bound trading, especially for the U.S. Treasuries. So we could see moving more towards overweight stunts once the, the cutting cycle begins. Okay, and I guess we, we've a lot of people have been waiting to go overweight duration, right? And we, we started out, I think, the year with, we'll, we'll wait for signs of cuts. In this case, do we actually need to wait for actual cuts to then make that shift. I think we'll probably do. If we look at the U.S. Treasury 10-year performance a year today, it's pretty range about 380 to 430. So we think we'll probably remain within that range in the near term before we see cuts. Right. Are you? Can we at least be confident that, the, at least as far as absolute yields are concerned, the highs are in, like the top is in already? We think. Yes, uh, the upside pressure to yields likely to be less compared to where we see them before because we are seeing inflation gradually coming down. Growth momentum compared to 4Q last year also moderating. So those two factors should support move lower in yields. Right. And what about, what about credit, for example? Are you looking at spreads? Are you looking at all in yields, for example? How are you? What's the best measure of valuation right now? Yeah, so currently, if you look at spread, very tight at the moment, historically low levels. But we think all in yields are still very attractive in our base case of no recession, we think that carry is pretty attractive to us. Okay, so still high yield, I think, is the only pocket of this global bond market that's done well. You're sticking to high yield? Is that is, is that an accurate assumption? Yes, yeah, okay. still prefer high yield because of that um, carry component there. Okay, and the trigger to switch out of high yield would be rate, same thing, rate cuts, for example? Um, I think, yes, with rate cuts, we're probably looking at the longer end of uh, that yield curve, but we think a no recession scenario still will prevent kind of uh, spreads widening from here. Right. We're also somewhat in between messaging from the Fed, so they're saying the data is starting to, the data is consistent that inflation is slowing further, but it's stalling as well. Is it worth putting in hedges in terms of inflation hedges as in case, as a tail risk, for example, just in case inflation does come back? I think if you look at the risks right now, there's definitely a risk of uh, inflation being sticky, as what you're talking about. Uh, it's coming down, but not fast enough, not as fast as what the market is expecting. Right. Clearly, the first two months of inflation data does suggest that there's a bit of upside risk. Mm. But I think a lot of that is um, driven by seasonality. So we really do need to see further data to confirm that. Mm. The other risk is the labor market is still very strong. To what extent can that really lead to further softening in inflation? Well, it remains to be seen. Right. And at JP Morgan Asset, how are you looking at China? So when we look at China, we think if we look at growth momentum, some more positive data coming through early this year. But we still think this is pretty uneven. We're looking at external demand being better than domestic demand and also weakness in property market. We're seeing that continuing as well. So overall, still more around a neutral stance on Chinese equities right now. Have a nice long weekend to you and your team, of course. Um, I'll be stuck here at work for a few more hours. Sylvia, we'll, we'll let you go. Of course, Sylvia Sheng, their global multi-asset strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Manager. We ended a conversation on China. We'll take you straight back to China. And, uh, and at the BOA Forum taking place, and the NPC Standing Committee Chairman Zhao Liji is speaking as we speak. There we go. Let's listen in. Asian home. We should jointly maintain security in Asia and contribute positive energy to world peace and stability. History and reality both show that peace and stability are the common aspirations of Asian people. The biggest consensus of Asian countries and the prerequisite for Asia's development. 
in the face of intertwined and complex global security threats. We should implement the GSI, follow the vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative and sustainable security, reject the Cold War mentality and block confrontation, oppose power politics and hegemonic acts, and maintain the regional order that accommodates the needs and interests of all parties. We must always keep in our own hands the future of lasting peace. The big news this morning in terms of well, bond markets and index compilers as, as you look at this reversal taking place across these markets and certainly this reversal higher in the Hang Seng Index and Chinese equities in general, uh, certainly bucking the overall weakness we're seeing and bucking also the early weakness coming through and maybe part and parcel to this is this FTSE story, the Russell, FTSE Russell story holding off and adding South Korea and also India. Uh, to their global bond benchmarks. Now, the agency says that the nations will continue to stay on their watch list. Let's bring in Hu Yun Kim, our Asia FX and rates reporter, joins us right now to tell us exactly what happened and why they were left out still uh, in, in this current round, Hu Yun. Hi. Um, so markets been closely watching FTSE Russell's country classification review overnight, and the results weren't that surprising. Um, as expected, the global bond and uh, global index provider um, decided not to add South Korea and India to its uh, global and emerging markets uh, bond indexes, um, delaying the wait for these countries to be added to the indexes that's set to lure tens of billions of dollars into the local markets um, by at least six months. Um, like I said, the decision doesn't come as a surprise. Um, in the case of Korea, the government has done a lot uh, the past couple of years to improve global investors' access to its local markets. But some of the changes are still underway. Uh, most notably, the FX, uh, the, the government will be extending trading hours for the one, the onshore one, in July. Um, in the case of India, uh, not a lot of changes have been made uh, since September uh, when FTSC held off um, on adding the country into um, its, in, its um, emerging markets bond index. Um, but one thing that was yeah, well, interesting, though, was... Uh, sorry. Ji Yun, actually, yeah, I was going to ask you, you, you mentioned six months. Is that when the next review will take place? And um, should we be expecting something else from, from, from that next review? I mean, might that review now actually see both India and also South Korea be included. Mm. Uh, that's correct. So the FTSE Russell does uh, these reviews twice a year, once in March and once in September. Um, global investors have said Korea has a better chance to be added to the index in September. Um, if it does make it into the index then, the government uh, has said that it would lure up to 70, uh, 70 billion dollars into the local bond market, um, e but even if it doesn't, the general view is that uh, is is that uh, the country will be added at some point, and with projected rate cuts by the Federal Reserve and uh, BOK uh, this year, uh, we're expecting some foreign inflows into the market. Nevertheless, if these hedging costs fall, I guess it's a good way to put that too. Uh, Hu Yun Kim, our Asia and FX uh, rates. Uh, report and certainly flows are, I think Huyan did a very good job there in highlighting the operative word, projected rate cuts. And so far, they've remained projected and potential um, across these markets right now. Okay, a reversal that we pointed out earlier on in Chinese equity markets, the rest of the region, though, like Singapore um, and, and Korea, are seeing some downside today, along with other major equity markets. And we're going into the Japanese lunch break, by the way. Uh, Nikkei 225 is off. Last we checked, over 1%. Uh, earnings, Chinese earnings, Chinese bank earnings to be more specific. ICBC uh, and Bocom out. Ag Bank and Construction Bank are coming out with theirs later today. Uh, look at that uh, on your screens. I think we did see a beat out of ICBC. Uh, Ag Bank also coming out later today. We talked about this at length already. Flip the boards, please. Uh, we're looking also at Chinese developers, also out. Vanco, 
country garden among those coming out with results later today. This is Bloomberg. Just going into the break, lunch break over in Tokyo, and equity markets are on offer. Equity markets, to be fair, are taking a backseat to the currency. And, you know, at 150, we're near the low end of the 24-hour range, where, in fact, this time yesterday, almost to the, to the very minute, uh, we hit 151.95 or 96, I, I believe, was the session high, which effectively took the exchange rate back to the highest there, going back to 1990. And shortly after that, 30 minutes after that, we did get the first warning shot, verbal intervention out of, the, uh, out of Japanese officials and saying they will not tolerate any of these moves, uh, sending us, of course, lower to effectively where we are. All that being said, jobs not done. And comments out of Christopher Waller this morning, sending the dollar in U.S. yields high, in fact, a two-year yield. And by the way, this is not something you normally see, a move like this in the Asian session, really reflecting this repricing uh, that effectively mini repricing that's taken place in, 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 the, bond, on the, bond, uh, in the bond markets right now. Four and a half basis points to the upside here on the two-year yield. Bloomberg dollar index is weaker, but effectively when you look at that against it appears mostly, uh, mostly stronger against uh, the rest of the Asia FX space. Right, we'll take you straight back to the BOA Forum. The NPC Standing Committee Chairman, uh, Chao Liji, is speaking. A couple of other things that he's talking about so far there that sort of these bullying acts are deeply harmful. He, earlier on, he did talk about peace and world peace uh, and development facing some stern challenges. He's still speaking. We'll bring you more details and more headlines coming through out of that speech taking place right now in the main hall at the BOA Forum, right outside where the speech is taking place, is Stephen Engel standing by with his next guest. Steve. Yeah, we're in the garden, fairly close to the big hall where, of course, uh, Mr. Zhang is speaking. We took our next guest out from that meeting. We're very thankful uh, to be joined by the Kansaino uh, founder and chairman and CEO, Yu Shi Feng. Thanks so much. Thank Mr. you to give me the opportunity to speak to the audience. Yeah. Thank you for, for coming out of that meeting, uh, uh, that speech. Uh, again, your results were just out as well. Uh, we do know that you had uh, a bit of a blip upwards in 2021 because of the COVID vaccine, but you've, you're mired in losses again. You had full year net loss of 1.48 billion yuan. Uh, revenue was also missed expectations. Can you explain why you're back into the red right now and what is the pipeline to get you out of the red? Yeah, if you read our annual report, uh, we did have a uh, significant loss uh, last year. But if you look at the breakdowns, uh, over 900 million RMB uh, yuan is based on, uh, it's actually caused by the COVID-19 vaccine write-offs, uh, de uh, depreciation, and, you know, all those are... COVID-19 vaccine related. And we have uh, over 600 million uh, spending on R&D uh, side. If we look at that side, we actually had a good year in terms of pipeline advance. Uh, we had over 10 R&D filings and initiated over six, uh, more than six clinical trials, some in the late stage, phase three. And we have her PCV-13, vaccine finished uh, phase three and the file for NDA. And we had a very good progress on the uh, potassium-based uh, uh, DTCP combo vaccine. Right. As you know, the uh, Chinese CDC number in the past two months, the potassium uh, disease case has increased dramatically. Yeah. Uh, this world or this country definitely need a, a, a new vaccine to really uh, to, uh, preventing the disease spread. Yeah. So that leads to the next question. How is this pipeline shaping up to uh, fill your your basic prediction uh -huh. you gave Bloomberg News a year ago that you would yeah. likely return to at least break even or profitability mm -hmm. by next year, 2025? Is right. that still possible or what? It's still possible. And uh, we hope, you know, we actually achieve that uh, even, uh, you know, uh, before the end of the year 2025. But uh, it's still on our target to get uh, the break even results uh, next year. 
you also had a deal, I believe, in the middle of last year with AstraZeneca. I spoke yes. to Pascal, the CEO mm -hmm. of AstraZeneca, yesterday, mm -hmm. essentially. He talked a little bit about the deal. But we don't have a lot of uh, clarity on what kind of vaccinations the mRNA deal that you're mm -hmm. going to have with AstraZeneca is going to come out of that. What what are we talking? It's COVID is in the past, yeah. but how are you going to use mRNA, which hasn't really didn't really pick up, obviously, uh, during, uh, wasn't adopted during the pandemic. Uh, no, yes. We actually had, a, you know, uh, up to phase two uh, clinical trial stage for COVID uh, vaccine on the mRNA side. But uh, certainly our collaboration with AstraZeneca is much more strategic. Uh, excuse me, I cannot disclose, uh, sure. you know, more details. But, you know, we do have a good relationship with AstraZeneca. Uh, not just uh, you know for one single product. We are actually had a meeting in the past months, and it, uh, I'm going to meet uh, uh, probably t today with Pascal again, and uh, we will have a, um, a further discussion in terms of uh, general, you know, uh, other uh, potential opportunities. And then, what opportunities are there to sell your vaccines abroad? I know you had a deal uh, for a meningitis vaccine in yes. Saudi Arabia. You had one that didn't pan out too well uh, mm -hmm. in Brazil as well. And I believe there's a lot, there's pending litigation there with oh. that company in Brazil. That's something separate yes, from separate. Saudi Arabia. Yes. But what are the biggest challenges and what are your expectations to sell into the international market? Well, international market, actually, uh, we had a good experience in the past uh, few years, uh, especially during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, time. Uh, we built up our relationship with our partners in many countries. I think that gives us opportunity to, for this post-pandemic era, to expand our, you know, product uh, to the other countries based on our uh, well-established uh, network and partnerships. Like where? Where? In the developing uh, well, world mostly? Or? Mostly developing world, but we are working with a certain, uh, like Gates Foundation, uh, potentially for the broad, uh, you know, uh, world market for some uh, innovative vaccines. Yeah. yeah. What does the Biosecure Act in the United States do to the collaborative nature of the pharmaceutical industry? I well, mean, that's a big threat if they're going to be essentially potentially, if it passes yeah. through Congress yeah. and the law is adopted, any federal money cannot go to companies that do mm -hmm. business with pharmaceuticals in mm -hmm. China that are of concern. I'm not yeah. alluding that CanSino mm -hmm. is of concern, but again, it's a further bifurcation mm -hmm. of U.S. and China. Yeah, it's, uh, we are closely monitoring uh, the situation, and uh, it's a concern from the industry perspective, I think, from both sides. Uh, I actually involved in the like uh, the what we call the track two dialogues on the public health, and that means uh, in the you know non-government settings, NGO settings, academic settings, we uh, you know once we get together, discuss our common you know interest and and how we work together. I think from my uh, conversation with our partners in U.S. or you know the. We are uh, quite uh, uh, agree each other. We need collaboration, not really uh, separation, um, because many of the public health issue, issue is a global issue. It's not any single country can deal with. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have experience in the past just few years. Uh, if we don't control in the global scale, the disease will never, you know, uh, will stop, right? Yeah. Have you found that collaboration increased or decreased through the pandemic? Well, the collaboration from our experience, uh, we had a good collaboration in many countries. Uh, certainly, there are, uh, might be other you know, issues that uh, you know uh, uh, raise up during the collaboration, but I think uh, that the intent is always trying to be on the good side. You talked about a healthy pipeline, but mm -hmm. investors are a little bit wary right now. Yeah. The stock is down 65% over the last year. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do to restore mm -hmm. investor confidence now that you've had several straight years of, of net losses? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I believe, uh, you know, to deal with any, you know, challenges, we have to take actions, right? And in our pipeline, we, you know, develop vaccine is not an overnight thing. We need to build up our technology platforms. We need to focus on the key product that will drive the future, uh, you know, growth of the company. 
So we, that's why we need to stay focused. And we are working towards that. And we'll be certainly uh, to really make our uh, organization uh, more uh, focused, more efficient. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, in the past few years, uh, due to the pandemic situation, we have to really deal with the, you know, the, the, the outbreaks. Uh, we, uh, uh, in a way, we were, you know, I guess, uh, grow uh, a bit uh, too fast. But uh, we are now uh, really to re-exam how we can really stay focused, get our pipeline in the, you know, to the uh, product, to the market as early as we can. We talked about messenger RNA yeah. vaccines yeah. earlier. We do know that that did help uh, mm -hmm. control the pandemic, spread of the pandemic in yeah. the Western world. China did not have an approved mRNA mm -hmm. vaccine uh, during the pandemic. What has kept uh, you know, a vaccine maker like yourselves from developing its own mRNA? Well, you know, mRNA technology actually is one of the platform technology we have spent uh, up to now seven years working on it. Uh, it is uh, uh, some new technology. We need to work out all the details to make sure the technology will fit for the use. Even for now, I see there are still challenges in dealing with MRA, you know, with, with broad application. And temperature of storage is one? Yes, exactly. Temperature, uh, you know, the storage, the stability of the product. If you look at the vaccines you need to put into the field, at least two years of shelf life, MRA certainly has not reached to that uh, point. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the advantages uh, for MRA is it can produce really fast right. and uh, in the large scale. And that's uh, especially beneficial for dealing with pandemics like we have experienced. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel, I mean, from yeah. my interview with AstraZeneca yesterday, I really yeah. got a sense that China's become a fundamental player in the global supply chain and development of mm -hmm. new drugs. Do you feel you have the right backing under this government, essentially new mm -hmm. productive forces, the new three in science mm -hmm. and technology, mm -hmm. is biopharmaceuticals under that umbrella? Are you going to get the support you need? I think, you know, China has a, such a high educated population and we have a pretty much good infrastructure to support biotech uh, development. Even for ourselves, we have a three global innovative products in the pipeline or already like uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the use. For example, our inhaled vaccine for COVID-19 is the world first, you know, uh, immunocosal delivery uh, uh, through inhalation. And that actually but that hasn't gone very far. That's the inhalation. Uh, through the, you know, breathing. Right. Yeah. Well, we had uh, almost like a uh, 10 million people use it already. Uh, but not adopted outside of China. Well, if you look at the, what uh, currently the uh, NIH is doing, they are uh, funding the research uh, to look into it. If you look at WHO position paper, yeah. it has been highly emphasized on the mucosal immunization, yeah. which is based on what we have uh, discovered. Shui Feng, yeah. thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Love Thank talking you. about that. Yeah, All right, we're going to send it back to you. You can yeah. get more from the opening plenary sessions at the BOAO Forum for Asia here on Hainan Island. Back to you, Dave. Steve, fantastic there with uh, Dr. Shui Feng, you co-founder, CEO, chairman at CanSino uh, Biologics. I was watching that interview. This is just probably me, the, me being weird. A, a vaccine conversation with that tropical background and the birds in... Uh, and the bird sounds in the background work, didn't it? Something you thought you didn't need until you, you actually get it. Hong Kong markets about uh, 72 minutes into the session, a very strong reversal, particularly among growth and tech. And you have the likes of higher uh, Billy Billy leading the charge as far as the uh, HS Tech Index is concerned. Uh, Shanghai Comp 3000, I love you 3000, get the reference. Uh, very, very quickly, FX markets, it's all about the Fed. Two-year yield is up. Most of Asian FX is on weaker footing. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Yeah, so we're stabilizing across shares of Xpeng in particular after what was really a very bad session yesterday, a very bad session overnight following what happened in, in Hong Kong. So we're stabilizing BYD out with earnings, of course, this week. I mean... Missed earnings, yes, but record earnings, yes, too. 1%. That's the big winner, of course. 
and really as it pertains to markets, right? It's do you pick between the top three, or do you go further down into the rest of the EV space in China and pick top ten? I mean, does it remain a top? Do the do the do the five to six, uh, five to nine uh, spots actually hold given the price war taking place? Certainly, the industry's done very well. In fact, a victory of sorts. The world's biggest electric car market is on the verge of such. The rest of the world will follow soon. It's according to David Fickling, our Bloomberg Opinion columnist, who in fact joins us right now out of Sydney. David, how are you measuring victory? What makes you say that? Well, I, I think if you sh just look at the sheer question of, um, of the market share war that's going on, uh, you know, I remember uh, six or nine months ago we were talking about um, uh, the, the EV, uh, NEVs in China sort of breaching the sort of 35% level. Um, now, of, uh, we, of course, we have, um, you know, BYD saying that by the middle of this year there'll be more than half of the market. And, um, and, and I don't think that seems excessive. If you look at the uh, China Passenger Car Association, their official, official statistics for this month, they expect we're already going to be at about 46 percent. Um, there's been this very dramatic uh, cost-cutting war uh, that's been going on over the past year and actually seems to be intensifying at the moment. Uh, and of course, um, the electric vehicles have a, have a real advantage because their, their fundamental costs are going down because the 40 percent of their cost is the battery and 40 percent of the battery cost is materials. And those materials, lithium, nickel, cobalt, um, those prices have all absolutely collapsed over the past year. So that is giving them a chance to to undercut internal combustion engine vehicles, uh, and there's really, uh, you know, the competition has uh, has reached the limit of where it can cut, and there's still there's still further to go for uh, you know for costs for the electric vehicles. Yeah, David, I even I'd even include lithium prices, for example, which is obviously a key input when you look at batteries. And the other side to that very same coin is, you know, the the, the sector while it has done very well. There are signs of oversupply, for example, in overcapacity. And I'm wondering for investors looking to pick, not the winners, because the winner, at least at this point in time, seems clear, BYD, maybe number two, number three, what the rest of that value chain looks like. Who will remain uh, as a going concern? Or is this sector within the sector itself, are we going to move into a period of massive consolidation across that entire value chain of EVs? I mean, I think that's inevitable when you look at the, uh, the sheer number of, um, of, of auto startups out there and the, the other ones coming on the market. Of course, you know, just today we're going to see Xiaomi. Um, uh, they're due to launch their um, electric vehicle um, offering. Uh, it's going to be a sort of, uh, a sort of uh, you know, sports car uh, model, priced pretty much to compete with the, the, the Tesla, um, uh, you know, with, with the, the Tesla Model, uh, model 3, the um, 250,000 yuan. Um, Huawei, of course, they're one of the, one of the big Biggest sellers in the market at the moment is a Huawei um, built SUV. Um, so there's a lot of these, uh, a lot of these companies that are sort of trying to get in there. But like you say, I think the um, you know the the ones that will succeed most are you know a the ones with scale like BYD and, and also be the ones that have a little bit of that export um, valve to compete because as you say there is a lot of capacity there. Um, the margins are going to be much better in export markets. BYD is seeing that. Um, you know, SAIC is seeing that. Um, uh, G GWM uh, is is seeing that. So. So, um, so I think those are going to be the ones that will uh, that will be standing. And a lot of these smaller startups, um, they they don't have the, the the capacity and scale to compete. You mentioned exports, David. Uh, let, let's look let's look at that. So yesterday, at about this time, in fact, uh, we were joined by uh, B of A, and who talked about the importance of China in this global supply chain, right? So for other countries to actually reach their own uh, EV targets. You know, protectionism doesn't seem to be uh, the way to go about it. How should we be looking at protectionism at this point in time as a lot of China's trade partners are erecting barriers to the likes of BYD, for example? I mean, you know, in, in the U.S., it's, you're very unlikely to encounter a, uh, a Chinese-built um, EV on the roads. It's 27.5% uh, trade barriers. The EU, of course, has got this investigation and, and a lot of talk that sort of similar scale of trade barriers will be erected there. But I think one thing to bear in mind about this is, is the position of the, uh, the, the, the Western automakers themselves. Certainly, if you look at what the likes of VW and Mercedes-Benz have been saying, uh, they've been making clear that they are actually... Um, 
you know, they're pushing back against this protectionism because, of course, they want to export uh, high-value cars to China. And, of course, China's already um, th this week uh, launched a case at the WTO against uh, the U.S. Inflation, uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act because, uh, you know, claims protectionism there. Uh, they also want to do what Tesla's doing and use China as a, as a low-cost production base for exports. So, um, so the companies that have that geographic spread, uh, I think, are actually going to be pushing back against this. The, the question then comes, uh, you know, there's a slight difference with North America. Uh, you know, GM obviously has a big China business, Ford not so much, and, and GM probably doesn't make very much money at the moment from its China business. So um, if those companies get more and more squeezed out of the China market, uh, does that push them more to be, uh, you know, to favor the sort of more protectionist approach? And, and, and probably, yes, it, uh, it will. So that is a big consideration. David Fickling, our Bloomberg Opinion columnist who covers energy and commodities out of Sydney for us. Uh, to our viewers, do check out his column today. China's EV market shows the future has indeed arrived. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. It's time for our China Brief, and we're looking at stories making headlines in local papers today. Shanghai Securities News, and we're looking at regulators here in the city, will be taking action to crack down on the so-called illegal quotations for listing uh, inquiries. And a paper says that a Shanghai Stock Exchange is actually strengthening uh, its supervision for institutional investors on IPO pricing. Now, meanwhile, you look at uh, what's on uh, uh, economic information news here and uh, really calling on employees here to seize the, quote, golden period of spring recruitment in a bid to boost employment. The reporter also noting multiple job fairs have been held for college graduates. It's estimated over 11 million people will be graduating in China from university this year. So hopefully the, the job market uh, does, is able to absorb uh, all that supply hitting the labor market. By the way, 11 million, that's also, that also just happens to be the target for urban job creation this year. In any case, of course, earnings are coming through and really a reflection also of another part of the economy that isn't doing as well. These two are coming out with earnings, the big ones, of course, Van Ko and also Country Garden are due out later today. We're up 1% ahead of those earnings coming through. Sunak was out with earnings, actually reversed uh, some earlier losses as Sunak China net loss, though, 8 billion, bottom of your screens, 8 billion uh, renminbi and overseas land also coming out there as well. Okay, uh, flip the board. So in the next hour of uh, Bloomberg Markets, pay attention to this one, right? So we're looking at signs of whether that's intervention, direct, indirect, or simply just markets doing their job uh, to coalesce against just making it more expensive to borrow and short a Chinese currency. Overnight, CNH Highbor touched the highest level in two years yesterday. Couple that with another strong fixing out of the PBOC today might be enough, question mark, uh, to alleviate some of the weakness coming through in the currency, but Christopher Waller giving the dollar boost today. That's it from us here at The China Show. Bloomberg Markets Asia is next. Stay with us. Good morning.